Hey everyone, my name is Corbin Dunn and I'm a CNC woodworker. This video is going to be about making my five petal flower bowl that I just recently designed. My goal with this video is to show you the general process on how to make this bowl or any two side machining operation. But I also want you to be able to learn some cool tips and tricks in case you want to do this exact project. But you can make this exact bowl. I have all the files set up in Fusion 360 and also Vetric VCarve. I did some test carves in both and you can download the tool paths and make it for yourself. As usual, the link for the files will be down in the description. Stock preparation. Stock preparation is kind of boring, but I want to go over a few tips and tricks that I've learned through the years making some large bowls. So if I want to glue up four pieces of wood together to make a large piece of stock, there are two ways to do it. You can first edge glue two sets of two pieces together and then glue those together with a large flat surface. Or you can face glue the smaller pieces together first and then edge glue those pieces together afterwards. And I really prefer the second way of doing it. It just gives me better results and a tighter glue line. So the first thing I do is I take those small pieces and I will joint one edge on each of them. After I joint one edge, I rip it on the table saw and I use the size to be a little bit over half my desired width. This piece is 12 inches wide, so I make them 6 and 1 8 of an inch wide. And since I have a drum sander, I like to run them through the drum sander before I face glue them together, just to give a little bit better of a finish. I set up my alignment jigs and drop the clamps down in them, and I prepare to glue it up. These ink rollers from Amazon do a really nice job of rolling the glue out. And for glue, I like to use Type On 3 because I assume my bowls are going to be used for something where you might put a liquid in them, and Type On 3 is just better for liquids. Before I put the pieces together, I sprinkle a little bit of salt on them, and this is just an old trick to keep them from moving when you glue it up. And I should mention that I only put glue on one side, and I see enough glue squeeze out that I don't think I have to put glue on both sides, so I stop doing that. After I have two sets of these, I mark on them with a triangle where I want them to align up. And then it's back to the joiner to flatten those edges. And one of the tricks here is if you joint opposite faces, the glue line will line up perfectly because any slight variances in your joiner fence will be compensated for. And for edge gluing those two pieces together, I like to make sure my jigs are aligned really well because any variances over the length will produce a uh, twist in the pieces when you glue them up. So I just use the level to make sure they are perfectly level with each other on the two ends. And like before, this is a lot of surface area that I'm gluing up, so I sprinkle a little bit of salt on to help them not slip and move when I clamp it. And obviously use those triangles to line it back up where you want it to be. You can never have too many clamps. And at this point, it's just a little bit of cleanup with a block plane. After that, I can flip it over to the other side and plane it to my desired thickness. Now, I have a 20-inch wide planer, and if you have a typical 12-inch desktop planer, and this piece is slightly wider than 12 inches, then you might have to rip the width to be 12 inches before you plane it. And notice I run the piece at a slight angle. This just helps avoid any snipe that I might get on the piece. After planning, I'll take it back over to the table saw and I'll get it down to my desired 12 inch wide width. And what I'm doing is I'm basing off the center glue lines so that they're exactly in the middle of the workpiece. So I'll do one cut, nudge it a little bit over until it's spot on six inches in the middle for a 12 inch wide piece, and just sneak up on it. Now after you use the rip fence, you need to go back and use the crosscut miter gauge to make a edge that's perfectly perpendicular to one that you rip parallel. Now it's probably not 100% necessary to do that, and if you can't do the reach on your table saw, just use the rip fence. It might not be a perfect square, but that won't really matter for a CNC woodworking project like this. Machining the drips, mountains, and epoxy stuff. Frequently I use dogs for locating a known offset on my CNC table. And I have a whole video about this if you haven't seen it, so check it out. I like to really consider the grain orientation in the final work piece. And I really want quarter sawn grain, so I try and figure out the best orientation for the top 
where the grain will kind of be perpendicular to the edges of the bowl. Using double sided tape is probably the most guaranteed way to make sure you don't hit anything when you're machining this. But I like to use clamps and this way I don't have to waste a lot of tape. Um, I'll post a photo of a better orientation than what I did here. Okay, so as usual, I'm going to start with a roughing toolpath followed by a finishing toolpath. And in Fusion 360, I generally like to use a 3D adaptive toolpath to remove a lot of material really quickly. But I found that was giving me more chip out than I really wanted. The uh, large steps followed up by small steps would chip off the little mountains, and I didn't like that. So instead I started using a pocket toolpath. If you're a Vectric VCarve user, then a pocket toolpath is the same thing as a regular roughing toolpath. I'm running this quarter inch bit at 16,000 RPMs and 128 inches per minute. After the roughing toolpath, I do a finishing toolpath. In Fusion, this is a morphed spiral toolpath. I did an 8 thousandths of an inch step over, which leaves a pretty good finish, but I did have a few rough areas that I would clean up with a wire brush and a Dremel and I would also hit some of the areas with some sandpaper. I blow out the dust with an air compressor and then I get ready for the epoxy step. I want to over pour the pattern just a little bit and in order to do this without spilling out I just use a bit of epoxy around the edge. I've been using silicone epoxy but I think really any of it would work. In general I like to seal the wood with a quick drying epoxy before I do the deep pour. And one of the things I do is I will tint the epoxy just a little bit so that it doesn't stand out too much. Now, I probably don't have to do this in all cases. I really think it's only necessary in wood that's really porous, like oak. A tight grain wood like maple probably doesn't need it. If you don't do it, you will generally see it soak through the edges of the, of the uh, wood, and that might show up in your final piece. Sealing will also help prevent air bubbles. While the seal coat is curing, I'll put it on the side so that I don't get thick areas pooled at the bottom of the little mountain areas in the valleys. I'll also kind of like help it out a bit. And while the seal coat is curing, I'll immediately start mixing up the deep pour epoxy. I'll begin the pour while it's still tacky, and this way you get some good adhesion with the tacky part of the epoxy. It's more of a chemical adhesion. If you wait for the part to dry completely, then you're going to have to scratch it and sand it a bit to get it to stick. The deep pour epoxy takes about three days to fully cure at about 70 Fahrenheit. And after that point, I can take it over to the planer and plane off the excess, the part where we kind of pour it over to get it to be fully full. And I just run it through the planer. This works pretty well. This is the point where if you start with a slightly oversized piece of stock, you want to plane it down to the exact thickness that we are starting with. And in this case, that's 2.25 inches. Machining the outside and bottom. Okay, whenever I'm making a bowl, I like to machine the outside and the bottom first. And so I go to prepping the top of the stock piece. I wipe it off with some acetone to get any fingerprints and any dust off of it. I then cover it with double-sided tape. I tend to use a lot. I don't want to have the pieces come loose when I'm machining them. And one of the tricks that I do is after I put the tape down with the backing still on it, I'll scrape it down really hard with a piece of wood to ensure that it adheres really well. So I take the backing off of the double-sided tape and I stick it down on my table. Now I don't have to be very precise when I line the origin up with my spool board and so I just kind of eyeball it. But one thing that is really important, I have that pattern created in the epoxy drip area and that pattern has a specific orientation. So I have to make sure that I rotate the bowl properly, that I have the original origin facing opposite from where my new origin is. If I rotated this 90 degrees in the z-axis, everything would get messed up. Now it's really important that the double-sided tape is squished down really hard to get to adhere properly. And I will just temporarily clamp down the piece and remove the clamps immediately to get it to be really tight. I also sometimes just stand on it and that kind of helps and seems to work fine. So I'll start the machining operation with a roughing pass using a 3D adaptive infusion and just regular 3D roughing in Vectric V-Carve. The Fusion 3D adaptive with a 3 8 of an inch spiral upcut bit removes a lot of material really quickly and is way faster than what you can get in V-Carve. 
And if you look carefully at this bowl, you'll see that I actually have a tab version. And I'll talk about why I really don't like doing tabs with bowls in some later video. But for this particular example, the overall shape is machined identically. I'll then go on to using a quarter inch ball nose to do the finishing pass. And in Fusion, I can do a few smarter toolpath tricks to just get better results, where you basically don't even have to hardly sand at all. This is a different bowl with the same shape that I machined, and the way I remove it is I just use a wedge. And I will pound a wood wedge over in the corner to just carefully undo the tape. The jig and alignment holes. Machining an alignment jig is now my preferred way to do these bowls. The jig allows me to align everything perfectly and it just is a lot easier than doing tabs or a previous way where I would indicate in the piece. The jig itself is just a 3 quarter inch piece of MDF and the shape is the cutout of the bottom of the bowl. I did have to enlarge it in a few areas to make sure that the corners where a bit would get when obstruct the bottom bowl piece. You should use double sided tape to hold down the piece and not clamps like I have shown here because if you're using the Vetric VCAR version the middle part might pop out and fly out so the tape will hold it together. If you're doing the Fusion version then it's going to just machine it all away so it doesn't really matter. The tool pass and Vetric VCAR sometimes they're not as great as I'd like and the quarter inch ball nose for the finishing pass didn't go as deep as I needed it to go in the corners. So I had to just clean it up a little bit with a 3 16 of an inch bit, which wasn't too big of a deal. I also had to clean up the bottom so the uh, bit wasn't going quite deep enough. Now the jig has some quarter inch alignment holes drilled into it. And this is one of the reasons I use a temporary spoil board on top of my regular spoil board. And I don't want to have a bunch of holes in a regular spoil board, so I just mount on another piece of MDF and drill my alignment holes there. The top and inside. So if I machine the jig correctly, the spoil board holes should line up perfectly with the holes in the jig, and the bowl should fit in perfectly in the cutout. I can then flip the bowl over, and the jig actually sits just a little bit lower than the bottom of the bowl. And this way, the bowl is the part that's going to be actually taped down to our CNC table. I wipe it off with a little bit of acetone, like I did for the other steps to get rid of the dust. I will also wipe down my spoil board with a little bit of acetone to get any dust off of the spoil board. I put down a bunch of tape. I really don't want the bowl to come loose. I also tape past the bottom of the bowl into the jig a little bit, so it kind of holds it all together at the right location. I put some quarter inch wood dowels into the alignment holes and remove the backing on the tape. I can then align the dowels into the spoil board alignment holes and squish it down really tight. And like before, I'll even just go and hop on it to ensure that it's really pushed down really well. When machining the top and inside the bowl, I use the same feeds and speeds as I did before, and again, a 3 8 of an inch spiral upcut bit to remove a lot of the chips from inside the bowl so they don't get stuck down in there is really helpful. And then I use the same quarter inch ball nose to do the finishing pass. And like before, this one that you're actually seeing is a tab version, which I don't recommend doing. So after doing this bowl in both Fusion 360 and Vectric V-Carve, I can tell you that the V-Carve version is going to require a little bit more sanding. And that's just because of the nature of how the toolpaths work in that program. With Fusion, you can really fine tune a lot of the toolpaths, but this does require a lot more knowledge and skill. Taking a quarter inch dowel and wrapping with sandpaper allows you to pretty easily get into some of the corners. And since you're using a quarter inch bit, the quarter inch a uh, dowel should work pretty well. Some other sanding tricks that I do, I will use a random orbital sander to sand the outside of it because it can kind of fit around all the outside curves. For the inside, I like to use power tools if I can, and I'll use my Dremel oscillating multi-tool with some sandpaper on it to sand those. That works okay, but a lot of the inside portions you just have to sand by hand. I'll sand the entire piece up to 220, and then I will go and raise the grain by lightly spraying it with some water, wiping off as much of the liquid as I can, and letting it dry. This is really good for a bowl because your bowls are probably going to be washed 
and you don't want them to be fuzzy after someone washes them one or two times. After I raise the grain, I'll sand it again with 220. The epoxy portion, I'll sand up to 320. The wood, I just stop at 220. For finishing, I like to use Osmo Top Oil, which is a food safe finish. I take a white Scotch-Brite pad and I scrub it on in. I put a really thin coat on and then I basically wipe off all of it with another clean and dry rag. I wait for it to dry 8 to 12 hours between coats and I generally put on 3 or 4 coats. So that's the general overview of how I made this bowl and hopefully I went into enough detail where you could actually make one yourselves. Go check out the files, link is in the description. And if you want to know more information like how I actually designed the shape, made it so it's actually machinable, just ask in the comments. Maybe I can make a video with those particular details. Thanks everyone.